Welcome to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Today's journey takes us on the flag carrier of the country, Royal Jordanian, in business class on one of their longest routes from their hub in Amman, Jordan, out to Detroit, Michigan in the United States. A route that's more important than I ever realized before actually hopping on board. We also get to look at the 10-year-old terminal here in Amman with one of my new favorite all-time lounges, and most surprisingly great business classes and onboard dining experiences this far in my travels. Use the timestamps down below to find whatever you might be looking for. Now off to the journey. Welcome to the main hub of Royal Jordanian Airlines, Queen Alia International Airport, the main airport of Amman despite being 18 miles south of the city. With roughly 8 million passengers annually, it's the largest airport in Jordan and the main hub of international traffic, with non-stop service to four continents. Up the escalators, we reach the departures level. There's a few entrances to the terminal, but before heading inside, we enjoyed the last views of the Amman countryside. Through each door to the terminal, we see a security check with access to the counters. As business class passengers, however, we get a bit of a treat at this step, as there's a specific entrance for Royal Jordanian Crown Class passengers or One World Elites, Crown Class being what Royal Jordanian calls their business class. Through door 1, not only do we get our own entrance, but there's a fully enclosed check-in lounge after the security check. The consultation-style check-in is welcoming and easy. Someone approached me to take my checked bag, I got my boarding pass and walked out the back entrance, where there's some more chairs for people wanting to sit for a little bit before the walk through the terminal. Now here is a fun little part of this check-in lounge. Once you leave the back of the lounge, there's a private enclosed walkway to the gates. On the way there, there's a number of decorations from Royal Jordanian including stuff about the creation of the airline and airport. The pathway ends with our own private immigration and security. Super seamless and relaxing process, and it dumps us out just past the main security, right next to the duty-free store. It is a good walk, however. After the duty-free store, we reached the main rotunda of the terminal. The Amman airport had this one main center area, and then two main hallways of gates. The gate times aren't released until about 90 minutes before departure, so we'll spend the next couple of hours here. Well, not here per se, up above actually. Up above this central area is the Crown Lounge, which is owned and ran by Royal Jordanian and was renovated just before COVID. It hosts not only One World Business Class passengers, but all business class passengers, since the only other lounge here is a small pay-to-use lounge. Through the door with boarding pass scanned and elevator upstairs, we reach the entrance to the lounge. The foyer is where we see some seating, some decor, the concierge, and the signage pointing us where we can find everything we need in the lounge. Essentially, there's two sides of the lounge, one balcony above each side of the terminal, each with different items in both sides connected by the little bridge towards the entrance. Exploring the first side, we see the duty-free kiosk where you can order things and they'll meet you at the gate. So I guess I didn't have to do my shopping, but at least I was able to use some more of my dinars. Past that is a smoker's lounge that was wonderfully decorated, but I couldn't handle the strong smell enough to get that shot. There's plenty of seating. The problem is that almost all of the seating is in groups of four or more, meaning that solo travelers have to take up those spots too, and it makes a lot of the space unusable to others unless you feel like sharing your space. So it got a bit tougher to find seating as the three US and four European departures got closer. I was bummed to see that the dessert cart was closed at this time, but only a few steps further was the ice cream bar with all kinds of fun toppings. If it wasn't 7am, I'd be all over that. Then was the cafe. They had all sorts of coffee and flavor combos. They also had Arabic coffee, but I've learned that I only get one or the other or I'm getting heart palpitations. There was also this pasta bar, different types of pasta and different types of toppings and cheeses. And if you're not feeling pasta, there's also a pizza stand with a couple different types of pizza. Just not the type of pizza I'm used to. Looks tasty enough though. Then was this area that looked almost like a spa or something, but there wasn't signs, maybe just a fun place to sit. There were these video games, but they seemed to be off at this time. That was it for that side, so we crossed the bridge onto the other side of the lounge. Where first we looked at the buffet, starting with the normal salad options. 
past that was more meze options. Also this big thing, which I'm guess containing something Jordanian, but my 5'9 self couldn't see in. Then was some hot options like eggs and chicken sausage. Then was a collection of little finger sandwiches and yogurt. And around the corner was the pastries and the coffee. Just past that was the bar where you could get mixed drinks or a number of beers on tap. And lastly was even more kinds of seating on this side of the lounge. All this great food and drink on both sides, all included in the cost of your ticket. Can't argue with that. I found myself a group of two chairs with a charging port that I bummed off the ground. Probably meant for lamps or vacuums, but charging ports weren't all that easy to find, at least at quick glance. Also, that Arabic pizza was good. Different, but good. The last thing I did in this lounge was visit the shower. The big unfortunate thing is that the showers aren't free and there's only one men's and one women's shower. The shower was 15 dinars, or roughly 22 US dollars. I paid for that just since a shower before a 12 plus hour flight always feels nice, and I still had some cash on me that didn't hurt to burn. The shower suite was nice, and for that cost, they did include some very nice amenities with it. After my shower, it was off to our gate, gate 106, which is down the right wing of the terminal. On our way there, we walked past many more local souvenir shops, convenience stores, and restaurants. There's one big corridor of gates, but these are all the Middle East and European flights. All US and Canadian bound passengers are required to go through a third security check to enter their gate holding area. There was a business class lane, so it didn't take long, but they took my fork out of my bag. The gate holding area is large, considering there's only six US and Canadian destinations served from Amman at this time. We also got the view of our 9.5 year old 787-8 that would be taking us to Detroit shortly. Then off to our gate where people were swarming. There was a line for business class and one world elite passengers, but I didn't see it for a while, so I ended up behind a bunch of other people. They also started boarding economy in the meantime, so the queue to board grew quickly. But at least that gave us some bonus views of our airplane down the jet bridge. After fighting our way on board, welcome to the business class cabin of the Royal Jordanian 787-8. Now I've actually flown this cabin before, kinda. If you've seen last year's video on Uzbekistan Airlines' 787 business class from Tashkent to New York, it was actually one of the aircraft originally destined for Royal Jordanian. They changed the seat color, but the seat design, seat belt, and bulkheads remained the same. The 222 setup is hardly revolutionary, but it is the standard for the 787-8 aircraft. Anyways, things are a bit different here than they were in Uzbekistan, so let's look at seat 2A on board this thing. The headrest is fully adjustable, sliding, tilting, and curling at the edges. The seat itself is really comfortable, but also super dirty. Honestly, I'm sure most seats are this dirty, but this is just a tough color to work with. When clean, I'm sure it looks stunning. Between the seats is a little partition. It's not huge, but that combined with the slight offset at least makes it not feel like your seatmate is right on top of you. The armrest below that is once again very comfy, but very dirty and worn. There's a literature pocket below that. It's just in kind of an inconvenient spot as it's nearly impossible to actually get to it without feeling kind of a weird stretch and twist you gotta do. It does have this little shelf below it at least, which is great for being able to store little things. Just be careful they don't fall below the seat. The seatback remote is in front of that. Not my favorite style, but helpful with how far the TV is. Above that is the seat controls. Always love the ability to adjust each piece individually. The large counter in front of that is more than enough space to be shared by both seatmates. If you do need some extra space, however, the tray table pulls out of the side of that console. There's one drawback to this style, however, especially on planes this old. They just don't sit flat. They droop down and things slide off. If you can use your armrest to prop it up, then it works out better, but still not perfectly flat. In front of you is the TVs which remain locked until just after takeoff. Below that is a small tray that couldn't really hold much more than a phone. The footrest below is not very large, like at all. You can see here the footrest in row 1, so I guess that's the play in the future. 
between the footrests is this small area that was perfect for storing shoes in the flight. Most rows have two windows, you'll just want to avoid row 4, which only has the single, unaligned window. Below that is an armrest that can easily be lowered. Over your shoulder is the main in-seat storage and seat plugs, where you'll find a universal charging port, USB port, and the headset jack. You also have a reading light over your shoulder, which doesn't really do much until you're reclined. Royal Jordanian really pulled through at least with these individual air vents. I'll excuse most things if an airline can give us this one simple item. On to the amenities, there wasn't much at the seat, but they came through the cabin handing everything out one at a time, which I have to imagine isn't the most efficient way to do it, but I did enjoy meeting basically the entire crew in the process. First was a bottle of water, not the biggest, so I'm glad I had one from the lounge still. No other pre-departure beverages. Even better, Arabic coffee was given out by one of the crew members. Then was the headset. It was super comfortable. The noise cancelling worked great and there was these little ear covers to help in case you didn't trust the sanitation alone. Then they came by with the amenity kits. We could choose the white, black, or red bags, although the contents were the same. It was a fairly basic spread of amenities, but the lotion was a pretty good quality, honestly. I was a big fan of the bedding. This comforter was plenty thick, and look at how plush that lining is. Then the pillow. It was a great size, and I'd put it at medium firmness. A bit soft for my taste, but plenty for most. Then we got the wonderful boarding complete call, while the seat next to me was one of only two empty seats on this flight. When I first realized this route existed last year, it took me a while to understand why Detroit. Detroit isn't exactly known for its transoceanic routes in the present day, with only 10 total routes, half of which are Delta operated, as in their history most of their international service has come from Northwest and then Delta. As it turns out, this route has existed at least since the early 90s, maybe longer, I just can't find the exact date. As it turns out, of the 3.5 million Arab Americans, roughly 410,000 of those live in the Detroit metro area. The three counties surrounding Detroit are actually the only counties in the entire U.S. with over 2% Arab population. Dearborn, Michigan, one of Detroit's suburbs, has the largest Arab population percentage in the U.S. at 40%. Royal Jordanian was actually the first carrier to bring the 787 to Detroit, although Amman isn't even in the top 10 international destinations from Detroit, meaning it carries less than 50,000 people annually. Even still, in their history, Royal Jordanian has dropped Los Angeles and Miami, both giant one-world hubs, but still kept Detroit despite being one of Sky Team's largest hubs, which I guess speaks to there being enough demand. Despite not being a One World hub, Detroit doesn't have a horrible domestic One World network with flights to almost all American and Alaska hubs as well as some JetBlue flights allowing for connecting tickets. For the first time ever, Royal Jordanian even upped this service to four times weekly and changed it to non-stop, previously operating via Montreal until now. Perhaps the most important reason for this route is that it bridges the gap between Arab Americans and Middle Eastern places that are notoriously difficult to travel to, such as Iraq and Syria. As a matter of fact, from Detroit, the largest cities Royal Jordanian sells tickets to in order are Beirut, Amman, Tel Aviv, Cairo, Baghdad, Jeddah, Riyadh, and Erbil. That explains part of the reason why there's 60% of passengers on this route connecting in Amman, but 95% of passengers originating in Detroit. Probably partially due to the lack of code share, but also the extreme demand from Detroit itself, which probably explains why Turkish Airlines also recently added service to Detroit International Airport. I guess my biggest question is if demand is truly as high as it looks on paper, why don't any other major Arab airlines serve Detroit? No Emirates, no Qatar, no Etihad. Not now, not ever. You'd figure with the 150 weekly flights to the US, between those, one of these airlines would want to fly to Detroit. Perhaps my most intriguing pitch that I'd love to see is if Middle East Airlines of Lebanon is able to achieve FAA Category 1 certification. If so, I could see Detroit being one of their number one prospects due to the large Lebanese population and the Sky Team partnership.
Now in the days, weeks, and months leading up to the flight, the departure course took them around Palestine, instead looping up through Syria and Lebanon, or down through Saudi and back up through Egypt. Because of this, you can understand my surprise when, shortly after takeoff, the captain came on to say, For those of you on the left side of the airplane, you have a great view of the holy city of Jerusalem. As I looked out to see Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and Tel Aviv. Very surprising routing, but it was very interesting to see this part of the globe from our climb out from Amman. First things first, they handed out menus for us. One was our food menu, the other was the drink menu. The drink menu included a list of mixed drinks or cocktails, followed by the wine selection available on board, and lastly was a list of aperitifs and liqueurs. Then was the food menu, there was multiple pages following a welcome page. First was the list of starters, then was a couple tapas options, followed by the choice of main courses, and lastly was the dessert selection after which was some non-alcoholic drink options. I found it a bit strange that the whole menu was just one meal, but I did enjoy the selection. Here's to hoping we get more options for another meal later on. Now that we had crossed the sea and were able to say hello to Cyprus, it was a good time to look through the in-flight entertainment, which, once initialized, began with an unskippable eight-minute ad for Royal Jordanian which I find funny because, like, I'm watching this on board your airplane after booking a ticket. Y'all already won. Not the widest selection, but you can see the categories here on the home page. Movies had their recommendations as well as the full list of all movies. After sorting through their available categories and genres, there is a pretty darn good selection of movies here. The only issue is that only a little over half appeared to be in English. The English options have a couple top hits, but also a whole spread of older movies. I wonder if the new 787s will bring a refresh to the entertainment system. Then the TV options, which have some strange choices. I still don't get the difference from TV episodes and TV series other than whether or not they're grouped together or just every episode displayed on one page. When looking at TV series, it is much easier to find things. They do have multiple seasons of some shows, although not full seasons, just a handful of random episodes. Then the music selection, which seemed to have a lot of Arabic options. The Western options seem to be in a bit more of a mix in one list, rather than full independent albums. I find it funny that the games are grouped by age group. Call me a kid, but these adult games seem boring. The kid and teenage games seemed way more fun. Then was the information about the airline with some videos about them. Lastly was the map. It contained the ability to view from a number of different angles or you could zoom and move the map yourself. Unfortunately, there is not any Wi-Fi on board Royal Jordanian's flights, although it seems that some have the ability for personal device entertainment if you have downloaded their app. The hot scented towels then signified that it was meal time. To start we got a bowl of nuts with a drink choice, I chose to go with some Jordanian coffee. Then they prepped the table with tablecloth, silverware, salt and pepper shakers, and choice of bread. Now this is where the meal service began and I really liked how they did it. They had spreads of food on a trolley. With their serving attire on, they came through the aisle serving each passenger their choice. First off was the first course. We got to select one of the starters and one of the tapas. For this course, I chose to go with the fennel slaw with oranges, peppers, and a mustard dressing, and the chicken tapas with pineapple and beans. Then was the main course. Once again, they came by with the trolley to take our selections and serve them to us. I chose to go with the traditional sayadia, which is a fish fillet with sayadia rice and pine nuts with a tahini parsley sauce. The dessert actually came in two phases, both on their own trolley. The first was an assorted cheese plate with walnuts, veggies, and crackers. Then was the men and salwa cheesecake with pistachio and chocolate on top. As we were finishing our meals, the windows plunged into the darkness. As we were heading towards the Alps and a few major European cities, I tried to raise the lighting a bit, but it seems they had locked it at full darkness. 
and it didn't return to our control until final approach into Detroit. I guess that means I'll be sitting in darkness today at noon. I guess if it's gonna be dark, I might as well check out the bed and get cozy. With no relax preset, we instead just get it to go all the way down. It almost meets up with the footrest, just a few inches of gap in between. We also can lower the armrest to make the surface a little bit wider. Now what really makes this thing top tier is that on request you can get a mattress pad. And y'all, this might be my favorite mattress pad of all time. I mean like potentially better than Emirates level of amazing. It hooks onto the back of the seat and then covers the entire surface from below the headrest to the top of the footrest. Then we lay down the blanket, fuzzy side down, making it one of the softest blankets I've ever had, especially on an airplane and plenty big so it doesn't fall off when tossing and turning. Lastly is the pillow, which is large enough to take up the entire space. All in all, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, but other than the Etihad residence, this might be my all-time favorite airplane bed. The only thing that knocks it down a couple pegs is that in a 222 configuration, you'd have to climb over people and you kind of have to share your space. I just hope that when they renovate the fleet and get new airplanes, they continue with this level of bedding, as it truly is one of the most comfortable sleeps in the sky. You can see here that in your seat, just how much privacy you have from the person next to you. Yes, you have to step over them, but honestly when you're laying down, it's hard to tell they're even there. On top of that, it's kind of unfortunate how tight the footwell is. It's not terrible if you're on your back, but you can almost forget about sleeping on your side. It's just too tight. I will say it's a big time plus to have the overhead air vents. That, combined with the fuzzy comforter, made it so that you can really get the perfect temperature. After relaxing for a few hours, they came by with another menu. This time for our mid-flight snack options. Rather than little snacks in the galley, it was awesome to have the selection of handcrafted mid-flight snacks. I decided to go with the roast beef option, which came with cucumber and pickle. That's right, chicken and the egg. Along with a mustard sauce on some bread. Then was the dessert, which was this harise, which was a Jordanian cake-type dessert with pistachio. Now there's two restrooms, like normal, in the business class cabin. One is by the cockpit, like normal, but the other one is in a somewhat stranger place. If we venture to the back of the cabin, there's an aft bulkhead with a shelf and large space. This is typically a galley, but I kind of prefer how they chose to use this space, despite the fact that it probably cramps cabin crew elsewhere. The lavatory is against the wall back here, but unfortunately it's just kind of basic with no real amenities, except a perfume they added later on. After getting some work done for a few hours, we finally reached the coast of Canada. The cabin lights were raised, and they passed out yet another menu, this time for the pre-arrival meal. I kind of like separating the meals by menu, although it seems a bit unnecessary to me personally. This menu is set up a bit differently. Essentially, instead of each page being different courses, it's all just set plates. So each page includes one first course, one main course, and one dessert. We just had to pick which one we wanted, and they brought it later on one tray. For this final meal service, instead of the trolley they had been using, they took our orders ahead of time, then brought the set out on one tray. In the meantime, however, we were given hot towels. I decided to go with the salmon option, which came with a spinach and pomegranate salad, potatoes and veggies in a butter lemon sauce, and for dessert, mafruka, a dessert with semolina, cream, and pistachios yet again. Super tasty, but y'all, I swear I ate my monthly allowance of pistachios in this flight alone. After the meal, unfortunately, they collected the headsets, meaning no entertainment with volume at least for the last 45 minutes of this flight. I was also a bit bummed because I chose this seat due to the arrival having an excellent view of Toronto and Detroit's downtowns. Unfortunately, it was a low overcast day in Toronto, so this is what it actually looked like. I guess we'll hold out hope for Detroit in the meantime. Royal Jordanian just celebrated their 60th anniversary last year as they were founded as the flag carrier in 1963 as Aliyah Royal Jordanian Airlines, named after Princess Aliyah bin Al Hussein, daughter of King Hussein, not Queen Aliyah, although a common misconception. 
Originally, they were private, although later taken over by the government. They launched with a DC-7 and two Handley Page Dart Heralds to Kuwait City, Beirut, and Cairo. As they grew and acquired more DC-7s, they expanded throughout Middle East, and in 1965, they inaugurated their first European service to Rome. After losing their DC-7s in the Six-Day War during an air raid, the fleet was replaced with Fokker F-27 Friendships, and later on, they welcomed in the Jet Age with Caravelles. In the 70s, they picked up some 707s, 720s, 727s, and 747s, as they expanded further into Europe and moved as far east as Pakistan. Largely, the 70s brought expansion across the Middle East and Northern Africa. The end of the decade was the first time they made it across the Atlantic, however, serving New York and later Houston. In the 80s, they officially dropped the Aliyah from their name and became just Royal Jordanian Airlines. They also modernized their fleet for the first time in a while with L-1011s, A310s, A320s, and allowing their most wild intercontinental expansion throughout North America and East Asia. Not much changed in the 90s. They did continue their growth, but mostly spent the decade signing agreements and joining organizations with other Middle Eastern carriers, allowing for better growth together. The early 2000s brought some great evolution for the airline. To start, they renewed their FAA certification and celebrated 30 years of nonstop service to New York, making them the longest reigning Arab airline with U.S. service. In 2007, they became the first Arab airline to join a major global alliance when they joined One World. Following that announcement, they were privatized. They also announced an order of 10 787s one month later. This was also the start of their cargo sector as they began turning old aircraft into a cargo fleet, and also ordering some new cargo aircraft. In the 2010s, the 787s were delivered and they were able to retire the A310s and A340s and also brought in Steven Peachler as CEO. You might know him as the former CEO of airlines like Virgin Australia, Fiji Airways, Jazeera Airways, Thomas Cook, and Air Berlin. Probably not a great sign that half of those airlines don't exist anymore. To start, in order to try and regain profits, he canceled the remaining 787s and A330 freighters. He then, shortly after, resigned in 2020. They've been kind of railed so far in the 2020s as the pandemic caused major losses, but they quickly were growing their revenue until the conflict just west of their border, affecting their North American and European ops, with flight times increasing by 20 to 30 minutes, and also brought a large decline in Jordan's tourism. The current CEO stated this tourism decline as an unnecessary overreaction, and that without it, the airline would have easily been profitable in 2023. As we look into the future, their current 787s have an average age of 9 years old, with the entire fleet just being higher than that. In the short to medium haul network, they just acquired their first Embraer 195E2s earlier this year, and also placed an order for six 787-9s at last year's Dubai Air Show, which will bring a nice refresh to the fleet. The goal is to grow the fleet by 60% to 45 aircraft over the next two years with the narrow body fleet taking the heavy lifting and spreading the 787s on more long haul routes. Jordan's in a region with presently troubled nations, many of which lack good long haul networks, so Royal Jordanian's in a good spot to maximize their market share by providing connecting journeys to places like Syria, Iran, Lebanon, and Palestine. While the CEO has refused to comment on future destinations, he has previously expressed interest in growth in Saudi Arabia and China. As for potential U.S. destinations, Los Angeles and San Francisco are the cities with the next most point-to-point -point travelers to Amman, currently lacking direct service. LAX had Royal Jordanian service in the past and also has One World connections. San Francisco is an Alaska hub allowing for some domestic One World connections and currently has a lot of passengers flying the United route through DC. 
So I wonder if Royal Jordanian wants to swoop in and take up some of that customer base. Regardless, my guess is that when those new 787 deliveries are scheduled, we'll get some news on those future plans. Royal Jordanian is operating in tough competition as it's part of the Middle East, which is dominated by airlines like Emirates and Qatar. Royal Jordanian is obviously a fraction of the size, so those airlines and their operations look a bit different. That being said, the country has a pretty great airline on its hands. The wonderful experience began right at the curb where I was pleasantly surprised to see the VIP check-in lounge for ground class passengers. Having this private check-in wing with comfortable seats provides a stress-free start to the journey and is something only seen in a few places like Qatar's first class wing, Uzbekistan's VIP check-in, and American's new first class check-in at JFK. The enclosed channel through a private immigration and security was the cherry on top. The airport is nice, small but nice. That's why I was so excited for the lounge. I thought the lounge had all the things one could need and maybe a bit more. The food selection is top tier. I'd say it's only beaten by Emirates and Qatar's lounges with better diversity and sit down dining options. In my opinion, the only places the lounge suffers is that it isn't the most private, being largely exposed to the rest of the terminal. I do like how many windows it has, but the other side is just fully open to the terminal. In addition, having to pay a little over $20 to use the shower facility kind of sucks. On board, the cabin is a bit outdated and worn. Its 222 configuration is far from industry leading, but also par for a 787-8. Unfortunately, they've also seen better days with all kinds of scuffs and dirt on each surface. I am hoping these 787-9 aircraft arriving soon will have an entirely reimagined cabin and hopefully will be seen on their longer routes. Other than that, I thought it was incredible. The crew was amazingly hospitable and welcoming, the meals were all incredible, and being served on the trolley was an excellent touch. The bed was insanely comfortable, possibly the best mattress pad out there, even rivaling Emirates' mattress pad, which is known worldwide for being the best in the business. The only things I would knock them down for is the lack of Wi-Fi on their aircraft, but I will say that they make up for it in my books with the individual air vents, becoming increasingly rare in the aircraft of today. Lastly is the value. Royal Jordanian's fares for direct flights aren't cheap to North America, with routes ranging from 2500 to 3500 one way. To save some cash, I booked this as a journey from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia to Detroit, with an overnight connection in Amman, and it cost roughly $1,700. At that cost, it's the cheapest business class from the Middle East to the Midwest. I kinda just wanted to say that, but seriously, it's tough to find business classes for that cheap from the Middle East to just about anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, so as long as you don't mind the connection in Amman, which can be anywhere from a few hours to overnight, you can get a fairly priced ticket. I really enjoyed my 24 hours in Amman and would love to return to Jordan and explore further. At that time I'd love to fly Royal Jordanian back home, but probably only with award seats booked through One World Partners. Let me know your thoughts below, however, and if you've ever visited Jordan and or flown with Royal Jordanian. Until next Sunday, however, safe travels, and I'll see y'all next time.